All right, we're back with another episode of the Undiscovered Games video podcast, where we take a look at the lesser known board games of the world and share those with you. I'm excited for this one today. We are going deep into the archives to find a very undiscovered game. This is called Tyros, designed by the great Martin Wallace way back in 2002, which makes this one of Wallace's earliest game designs and definitely one of his lesser known games. There's not much content about Tyros anywhere on the internet, and these are the types of games I love to feature on this channel. So if you're not subscribed yet, make sure you click subscribe right here on YouTube at undiscovered underscore games to learn more about lesser known games. So what is Tyros all about? Well, this is a very straightforward idea here with a couple little twists that I love. So it's a card driven game where you play cards to do your actions. Your actions are very simple, like moving these little ships around the Mediterranean to build cities. The cities let you build more ships to then expand your presence out farther on this map. So it's basic like territory building and expanding. There's some area control and area movement. There's some hand management. You can even trade cards with your opponents. So there's a little bartering as well. Lots of standard board game mechanisms here. But what's cool is there's this really neat scoring system that I've never quite seen before. And it revolves around these circular empire tokens. So at the beginning of the game, there's only four of these on the board. And as the game develops, these empires are going to grow independently of the main gameplay itself. These are neutral empires, they don't belong to the players, but the players decide how these get built out over the course of the game. And the idea is that at the end of the game, you want to have your cities and ships in the biggest empires because those are going to be worth more points. It's like this fluid changing map which makes you reevaluate your decisions every round. And that part of the game to me is the sweet spot and that's what makes this stand out from other games and I'll get into all that in the video today. And finally, before we get started, I designed my own player aid for this game because I just really wanted to visualize what I could do on my turn as well as remember that end game scoring. So I designed a full color player summary I uploaded it over on Board Game Geek, and I'll post that link in the description below. You can download it, print it out, keep it with your game, and I think it will enhance the gameplay a little bit. All right, let's take a look at how to play Tyros. First, each player chooses a player color. We have white, gray, black, and red to choose from, and you're going to take all your ships and all your little square city tiles in your color. Next, you're going to separate the four different colors of empire tokens. Just make four piles of these. We have purple, yellow, orange, and green. And then you're going to mix these rectangular tiles face down so that nobody can see the numbers on the other side. Each one of these tiles corresponds to one space on this map. You'll notice the map of the Mediterranean is broken up into a grid, and each grid space has a number. Well, these tiles correspond to this grid. Now we have to set up our starting empire tokens. The game always begins with one of each color token on the map. Now I like to do the variable setup so the game is a little different every time. It's pretty simple. You just draw the top four tiles from these map tiles here. Let's say we draw the 11, the 5, the 27, and the 22. Now you arrange these from highest to lowest, and then you have to look and make sure that no two numbers are directly adjacent on the map. So the 11 is not adjacent to the five, so we're good there. The 27 is adjacent to the 22, however. So you have to discard one of these tiles, you just put it back on the bottom of the stack and draw another tile. So here we draw the 24, so that one works. So none of these numbers are directly adjacent to each other on this map. Now, starting with the highest number, this always gets an orange. So put an orange token on the 27, Seven. Next highest always gets a yellow, so here we have 24 with a yellow. Next highest always gets a green, so 11 gets a green, and the lowest number always gets a purple, so 5 gets a purple. Now these four tiles get discarded from the game, you do not need these, but the remaining map tiles get reshuffled, and then you're going to deal four face down to each player. This is their starting hand, each player can look at these, but they are kept secret from your opponents. Next, you're going to shuffle all these cards together, make a face down draw pile near the board. And finally, everybody is going to take two of their ships and place them here in Tyros. Notice this space does not have a number. And this Tyros space is kind of an exception to the main rules of the map. And I'll get into all that here in a moment. All right, now you're ready to play Tyros. So after you determine a start player, give them the start player marker. And now you're going to begin the round by dealing out new cards to each player. In a four player game, you're going to deal everybody 10 cards. In a three player game, 
game, each player gets dealt 12 cards. Deal these cards face down, and these are the player's hands, kept secret from their opponents. Now you're going to do the expand empires part of the round. Starting with the start player, you look at your map tiles. So remember, everybody has four of these map tiles. You have to choose one that is directly adjacent to one of the colored tokens already out on the map. So let me give you an example. Let's say I'm looking through my tiles and I have the 23. So I could play the 23 that's directly adjacent to this yellow token. And then I just expand this yellow empire by one space. So I take a yellow token from the supply and add it to the 23 space. Now the 23 tile gets discarded from the game. And then if there's any tiles left in the stack, I draw the top one and refill my hand. Then the next player in clockwise order goes, they play, let's say the 22 tile. Now this is adjacent to a yellow and an orange. So they could choose whether to place an orange or a yellow token here. Let's say they want to expand the orange out further. The next player plays a 10, which will expand the green up one space. And the last player, maybe they don't have any tiles that are directly adjacent to any of these colors. So if that ever happens, they just show their opponents their hand of tiles and say, look, I can't play one of these. Then they secretly choose one, put it on the bottom of the stack and draw the top tile. But they will not place a colored empire token on this turn. Now, it's important to note, in a four-player game, you only do this once around the table, but in a three-player game, you always go twice around the table, expanding empires. Now, to complicate things, there is a slight exception, and that is at the very beginning of a four-player game, you do go around twice. So just that very first round of the game, you do expand empires two times around the table. Just kind of helps fill the board up a little bit with some empires before you go into your player actions. So because this is the first round of this four-player game, we're going to go around one more time. Let's say I play the 26 tile. That gets an orange, and then I draw back up. The next player plays the 18, which expands the yellow empire. They draw back up. Next player says, I can't place anything, so they have to discard one to the bottom, draw a new one. And the final player plays a 4, which will expand the purple empire. Once everybody has done their part expanding empires, now you move on to the meat of the game. This is your player actions. So starting with the start player and going clockwise around the table, each player takes turns taking one action at a time. Each action requires you to play some number of cards from your hand, and the round continues until all the players pass on consecutive turns. I'll explain more about that in a moment. So let's take a look at all the possible actions you have to choose from on your turn. You can either move a ship, build a city, build a ship, trade cards, or pass. Those are your options. Now let's look at those in detail. First, we have moving one ship. On your turn, you can play a certain number of cards to move one of your ships to a different space on the board. The number of cards you play determines how far your ship can move. Furthermore, you have to play all cards of the same color. The color is where your ship is going to end its movement. So let me show you an example. Let's say my ship here, and I want to move up to this green empire space right here. I would have to play one, two, three, four, five green cards to move my ship up here. You must end your movement on an empire space, so a space that has one of these circular tokens. You can sail through other areas, but wherever you end has to be on an empire. So if I wanted to sail to this yellow space, I could go one, two, three. That would cost me three yellow cards to sail from here to here. A couple other rules to keep in mind when moving your ship. First of all, you can never end your movement on a space that has two ships. So each one of these spaces out here is going to be maxed out at two ships. You can still sail through those spaces, you just cannot end on a space that already has two ships. Another thing to keep in mind is this sea monster space is completely off limits. You can never enter or travel through this space. So if I wanted to get from Tyros over to this yellow space, I would have to go up, over, over, and down or something like that. I could not go straight through. You can never move your ship diagonal either. You always have to go up, down, left, or right for one move. Another rule to keep in mind when moving is you must follow the ocean. So notice number 30 and number 29, these spaces are directly adjacent on the map, but they are not connected by water. So I would have to go from the 30 over here, up, and then over to get up to the 29. So that would cost me three cards to move there instead of just the one. Uh, likewise, over here on Italy, we have kind of a strange situation where if I'm here and I want to travel across Italy, I would have to go down here and then back up onto this same space to get around the boot. So that's going to cost me an extra card to go down and around. So you just have to remember, even though it's a grid and you're moving adjacent, you have to make sure there is water connecting where you're moving. The final rule to remember when moving a ship, if you ever end your movement on an opponent's city space, you must pay them one card from 
from your hand. This is sort of like a docking fee for parking your boat on their city. Now, we haven't talked about the cities yet, but that's these square tiles. These will get built throughout the game. And remember, this is only where you end your movement, and it's only if you end on an opponent's city space. You pay that opponent directly one card from your hand. Now, that card cannot be one of the cards you played to move your boat. So just keep those things in mind. That's all the rules for moving your ship. The next possible action is building one city, and this is how these little square tiles get placed onto the map. To build a city, it must be in an area where you have a ship and your ship has to have complete control of this space, so no opponent ships can be where you're going to build. To build a city, you have to play five cards of the same color, and the card color has to be the empire of where you're building. So let's say my ship is here and I want to build a city. I have to play five yellow cards because this is a yellow empire. So I play my five yellow cards and I place one city tile out on this space of the grid. You always put your city tiles on these little dots. Each space of the grid only has one dot. So you can only have one city per grid space. So no other opponent can build a city in this space for the rest of the game. After you place your city tile, you have to lose that ship where you built. So this ship comes back to my supply. Now there is a discount for building cities. Remember I said it costs five cards of the same color. Let's say the setup was like this and I had two ships here and I wanted to build a city. If you have two ships on a space, then you get a one card discount for building a city. So here I would only have to pay four yellow cards to build the city and I build the city and I only have to lose one of these ships back to my supply. That's all the rules for building a city. So why do you want to build a city? Well, there's two reasons. One is for end game scoring, which I'll discuss later, but the other is for our next possible action we can choose, which is building a ship. On your turn, you can choose to build one ship in one of your cities. You just play one card to the table. The card color must match the empire where you're gonna build. So let's say I have a city built here in this orange area. I can play one orange card to spawn one ship on this space right here where I have my city. Now it's important to note there is an extra fee if there's already a ship on the space where you're building. So this can be your ship or an opponent's ship. You just have to pay one extra card of any color to do that. So let's say it looked like this. I still play my one orange card to build a ship, but my opponent already has a ship here. I just have to discard one extra card from my hand. That can be any color, and I have to do that whether it's my own ship or an opponent's ship that's already on that space. Now, if there's already two ships on this space, I cannot build a ship because remember, each space has a maximum of two ships. So if there's two ships on this space, I cannot choose to build a ship here. Now, I could build a ship from one of my other cities if it's open, but from this space here, I would have to move one of my ships off first before I can build any more ships here. And there's one little weird thing to keep in mind with Italy. Notice how the circle on Italy where you build a city is on the west coast. Well, whenever you build a city there and then you build a ship, that ship is going to go where the city is on the west coast of Italy. So if you want to move east, you're going to have to go down and around the boot. Now, before I go on to the next action, I want to talk about this Tyro space of the board because this is a little bit of a weird area to understand. Just remember, at the beginning of the game, each player started with two ships on Tyros. Now, that limit sort of stays in effect until a player builds a city on Tyros. Once a player builds a city there, then it becomes a normal space. But until that happens, each player can have up to two ships docked on Tyros. You can also build ships on Tyros as long as nobody has a city there. So the way that works is let's say the board looked like this. Let's say the white player has one ship on Tyros, the gray player has two ships on Tyros, and I, the red player, have one ship on Tyros. So there are four ships on Tyros. I am not at my maximum of two, so I'm going to build a ship on Tyros. I have to play one card to build the ship, and then I have to play four cards, one per other ship there. So that would cost me five cards to build a new ship on Tyros. Those cards can be of any color, and that is a legal move until a player builds a city there. Now you're probably wondering, how could a player build a city on Tyros? There's no numbered space on that, so how does that even become an empire to be able to build on it? Well, anytime somebody expands the empires on the 31 or the 32 space, then whatever token gets placed on that first immediately goes to Tyros also. So like when we're placing those tokens at the beginning of the round to expand the empires, let's say a player plays the 31 tile and makes it orange, now Tyros automatically becomes orange. So you just put another orange token out. Now, you know, once all these ships are moved out and there's only one player that has control of Tyros with their ship, 
they can build a city like normal by playing five orange cards and then they put their city tile there and now this space becomes normal. So the normal rules apply. You know, only two ships can be docked there and only the player who owns the city can build a ship there and so on. So the Tyro space is a little bit of a wrinkle, a little bit of a weird spot in the rules that you really have to wrap your head around. But once you understand it, it's not too bad. Okay, let's get back to discussing the rest of the player actions. Next up is trading cards. Now, if you choose to trade out cards, you get three possible options. You have to choose one. So the first option is just discarding one, two, or three cards from your hand and then refilling your hand by one, two, or three cards from the top of the deck. The next option you have is trading three cards from your hand for one card of your choosing from the discard pile. So as the players are playing cards to do actions, you're creating a face-up discard pile, and when you do this option, you can spend three cards from your hand and take any one card you want from that discard pile. So it's obviously a bad trade ratio. You know, you're giving up three cards to only get one, but you get to choose which card you take. It's also important to note you do not reshuffle the discard pile until the end of the round. So once that draw deck runs out, you can't even do that first option I talked about. You'll have to do the three to one trade with the discard pile, or you could choose the third option, which is trading with one opponent. So another way to trade out cards is to talk to the players around the table, and you're allowed to make a deal with one other player each turn and you can freely trade how you want, like give up some green cards for orange cards in return or however you want to do that, a little bit of bartering there. So once again, if you choose this trading cards action on your turn, you have three options. You can either trade out cards with the top of the deck if there is any deck remaining. You can trade out cards with the discard pile at a three to one ratio, or you can trade with one other opponent. The final possible action you can choose is simply passing. Now, passing is kind of interesting in this game because when you pass, you're not necessarily out of the round. The only way the round will end is if all the players at the table pass consecutively. So if I pass, they pass, they pass, they pass, then the round ends. But if I pass, they pass, they take a turn, they pass, well, not everybody passed consecutively, so when it gets back to me, I could take a turn again, because that player that went might have affected the board and opened up a new possibility for me, or maybe they traded some cards with me, and now I can do what I wanted to do before. So the passing idea can be used strategically. You can use it to sort of bide your time and see what the other players will do, and things like that. So just remember, once all the players pass consecutively, then the round ends. Now at the end of the round, you're allowed to carry over three cards from your hand into the next round of the game. Once everybody discards down to that three card hand limit, then you shuffle all the cards back together, pass the start player clockwise, and start a new round by dealing out new cards. Again, in a four player game, you'll deal out 10 new cards to each player. In a three player game, you'll deal out 12 new cards to each player. Make sure you deal the full amount of cards to each player, whether they carried cards over from the last round or not. So some players might start the next round with more cards in their hand, you know, if they carry them over. So you just keep repeating that process round after round. The game is going to end as soon as a player plays that last map tile from their hand to expand the empires. That will trigger the final round of the game. So you still play the full round. You know, all the players take all their actions and whatnot. But once that round ends, that will be the end of the game and we do our end game scoring. Now let's talk about that end game scoring because that's very important to understand and that will help you visualize the strategy a little bit better. You know, why do you want to build cities in certain areas? Areas. Why do you want to expand certain empires over others? Why do you want your ships in certain areas? So let's talk about the end game scoring. Now the first scoring to keep track of actually happens during the game, and as soon as a player has at least one city in all four of the different empire colors, they're going to get seven points added to their end game score. So you have to remember to watch for that as the game progresses. That can be a little difficult to remember if you're new to the game, so just make a note of that. It's kind of a race to build a city in all four colors. Now the way I like to do the end game scoring is first look at each empire individually. So first we're going to look at the orange empire. Which player has the most cities in the Orange Empire. They're going to get seven points. Do that again for the yellow. Which player has the most cities in the Yellow Empire? They're going to get seven points. And so on for each color. Now, if there's a tie when you're trying to figure out who has the most cities within an empire, nobody gets the seven point bonus for that empire. Now comes the really cool part of scoring that I was talking about at the beginning of the video. Now is where the size of each empire is going to dictate how many points we get for our cities and our ships that are out on the map. 
So first we have to determine which color empire is the biggest, the second biggest, third biggest, and fourth biggest. So you just count up the spaces of these little colored tokens that are out on the board, and then you're just going to rank these from highest to lowest based on how much area they take up. Now if there's a tie, like say the orange empire had 10 spaces and the green empire had 10 spaces, then you just have to refer to this chart. It always goes in this order, orange, then yellow, then green, then purple. So in that example, orange would be considered bigger than green, even though they both have 10 spaces. Now the players are going to earn points for their cities and their ship controlled spaces, and the points are going to depend on which empires they're in. So the bigger empires are going to give more points. Now for a space to be considered ship controlled, you have to have the only presence on that space and there can be no cities. So I could have one or two of my ships on this space, that would be ship controlled. But if my opponent is on this space with me, that is not ship controlled. And if there's a city on this space, that is not ship controlled. It doesn't matter if it's my city or an opponent's city. So basically any ship like by itself or with another ship of the same color, no cities, that's a ship controlled space that will generate points. So again, you're going to organize the empires biggest to smallest and then just give out these points based on this chart. So the biggest empire is going to give 12 points per city in that empire and then six points per ship controlled space in that empire. Then the next biggest empire is going to give 10 points to each city and five points to each ship controlled space. Then the third biggest empire is going to give nine points to each city and four points to each ship controlled space. And finally, the smallest empire pays out eight points to each city and three points to each ship controlled space. Once again, I'll put the link in the description below for my player reference sheet that I created. It has a summary of the scoring on it as well as the player actions that you can take. I tried to put some symbols on here to make it easier to visualize at a glance what you're allowed to do on your turn as well as that end game scoring. I'm also going to include a link to this score sheet here. Another Board Game Geek user designed this. I did not create this, but this is very handy. It helps you do the end game scoring very quickly and you can easily mark as soon as somebody gets that seven point bonus for building a city in all four empires. So that handy score sheet, link in the description below along with the link to my player aid. There you have it. That is how to play Tyros. I think I covered the vast majority of the rules. I definitely still recommend reading through the rules yourself just in case I missed something. I did pose a question over on the Board Game Geek forums and I never received a response. So I just went ahead and made this video, but I'm 90% sure on the rule of moving your ship. The rule book never says move your ship though. It says move a ship. Now I am using the English translation of the rules. This game was never released in English and I could not find a copy of the original German rules. So are you allowed to move your opponent's ship? I highly doubt it. And the original German rules probably clear that up, but my copy of the game only came with this English translation of the rules. And it always just says move a ship. I've never been able to find anybody online talking about moving opponent ships. So like I said, I'm 90, probably 95% sure that you can only move your own ship. But I just found that kind of interesting. And I did pose the question just in case, you know, somebody else was wondering that. Now, I did find at the very beginning of the rule book where this might be the answer I needed. It says the players are Phoenician traders and sailors exploring the coasts of the Mediterranean in their ships launched from ancient Tyros in the east. So that kind of implies that you're just exploring the Mediterranean in your own ships. It doesn't really make sense that you would be able to move your opponent's ships. And based on other Martin Wallace games, he doesn't tend to have a lot of mean interaction where you can really screw up your opponents. And that would really have huge implications if you could move your opponent's ships put them into bad positions and things like that on the map. So I don't think you're allowed to move your opponent's ships, but if anybody has the original German rule book, if you could let me know in the comments below, I would greatly appreciate it. I would just like to see what the actual German wording is for move a ship. But for now, we're going to get into my rating and final review. Now, this game is fairly new to me. I've only played four times so far. I've played three of those at four players and once at three players. I will say I definitely prefer this game at four players, but I'm going to give this an eight 
8.5 out of 10 for now. Now, 9 and above is like a top tier game in my collection, so it's just short of that, which means I definitely want to play this more, explore it more, and, you know, with the right group of people, this game really hits, and it's more of a gamer's game. This is not a gateway style game. This is not something I would show, you know, to a new gamer or bring to family game night, but if you have a group of gamers that wants to play like an old school, gritty, grind it out type of a game, I think you're going to like this one, especially because it's a Martin Wallace game that not many people have ever heard of. My favorite part, as I mentioned earlier in the video, is the expanding of the empires. The empires are not owned by any players, but each round the players kind of determine how those empires grow, which ultimately affects the scoring, which is going to dictate what you want to do in the game. So it's a player driven game in that regard. You know, how those empires take shape over the course of the game really drives your decisions. It, it affects, you know, where you want to move because your card colors have to match where you're traveling to, where you're building your cities, where you're building your ships. The color of the cards has to match those empires. So that part of the game I really like and then just how it affects the end game scoring is just really cool. I've never seen that done in another game. The closest game I could think of is Reiner Knizia's Genesis, which I covered earlier uh, last year on this channel. And those are two very different games. This game is nothing like Genesis, but just that kind of reminded me of that a little bit because the colored areas get built out and that determines how they score. So that to me is the sweet spot of Tyros. I also really like the card play in this game. It kind of reminds me of Brass, which is Martin Wallace's most popular game where, you know, you have to play a card to do an action. And that's kind of how this game works. And I like that you do have the option to trade out cards. You have that deck of cards and you can trade, you know, up to three cards and get three new cards from the deck. Well, a lot of times players rush to get that deck depleted because once that deck is depleted, the only thing you can do is either trade with other players or trade with that three to one ratio with the discard pile, which is a horrible deal, but sometimes you have to do that. So I like that little added tension there. Like, oh no, the deck is going to run out. I better trade cards while I can, but I hate to waste my whole turn doing that. You know, that's your whole turn because you only get one action each time. So like I said, this game is a grind. You really have to be efficient and be patient, but it does reward that patience if you just let it happen. You know, take it one turn out of time don't try to do too much i really like the passing option too how that does not necessarily kick you out of the round you know you can pass and then when it gets back to you as long as not all the players have passed consecutively you'll get to go again if you want to so a lot can change between now and your next turn you know if another player takes a turn they might swap out some cards with you or maybe they change the board state and all of a sudden you can build something because maybe they moved their ship that was blocking you or something so i like that you can just pass Ass and sort of wait it out, see what happens, and then come back into the round if you want to. Um, if I had to say anything negative about this game, I would say there are some turns where you feel strapped with the cards you have. You cannot do anything meaningful um, except maybe make a trade with another opponent or trade that three to one with the discard pile. But I do like that the game gives you that option to at least give you some flexibility. So that's not terrible. The luck of the draw does not bother me too much in this game. Another thing, very minor complaint is these ships are very fiddly they're very small and the tokens are very small you know the game itself is very small I mean this is a small board a small box and I tend to like that because it's kind of a charming little production here but it is a little fiddly to move those ships around you know that's just a minor gripe aesthetically the game does not bother me I know some of you out there will probably hate how this game looks you'll think it looks very ugly and drab and boring and you know I agree it does look a little boring but it's very functional. I will say it's easy to look out on the board, see where all the empires are, where all the other players are, you know, which spaces have city spots available to build and things like that. It's easy to see everything at a glance. It does not look busy or confusing. And that goes a long way with me liking a game. So there you have it, Tyros, definitely a keeper in my game collection, one I'm excited to play more. I uh, love getting in each other's way. You know, it's got that really cool scoring system and it's just cool to have a Martin Wallace game that not many people know about. So hopefully this video helped you decide if Tyros is right for you. Have you ever played this game? Have you ever heard of this game? You know, let me know in the comments below what's your favorite Martin Wallace game. Mine is probably Brass, the original Brass, which is the same as Brass Lancashire. I really like Anna
Anno 1800, even though that game gives me anxiety because of the long-term planning that's required. Um, but it, I do really like the game Anno 1800, and I have a couple other Martin Wallace games that I plan to feature on future episodes, so stay tuned for those. Meanwhile, if there are any rules clarifications that come up, I will put those in the description below, so always check the description below. There's also a donate link in the description if you like my work of finding these lesser-known, older games and bringing them to you. Um, any donations are processed by PayPal, and that's just a way you can help out the channel, and I really, really appreciate all of you who have donated. But the best way to help the channel, like I always say, make sure you click subscribe right here on YouTube. As long as my subscriber count goes up, I'm going to continue to make content like this on a regular basis. Stay tuned for the next episode. i got another great undiscovered game coming your way. For now, I am your undiscovered host saying thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.